Well, with us now in the RISE studio is the Director of Paths to Freedom, Richard Paklepa. Um, Richard, welcome to the programme. You are an accomplished Namibian filmmaker, and Richard's work has been screened across international film festivals, winning him a massive awards for his heart-wrenching films about human struggle. He's here ahead of the UK premiere of Paths to Freedom, and we welcome him to the programme. Thank you for coming in. Um, let's start off by looking at what life was like for the Namibians under South African rule. Give us a sense of what it was like. In South, um, in Namibia, South Africa had illegally occupied the country since 1915. And it was German before then, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it was German. And then under the arrangements of the League of Nations, South Africa, in the name of the British government, had control over Namibia. And the indigenous population basically was, first of all, dispossessed of their land, and then made to work as contract laborers on their own properties, and on the mines, and in the fishing, and the industry of Namibia. Contract labor was really a hidden form of slave labor, because people had no right to choose their employer, had no right to leave their employ, and were paid a pittance. In fact, often the money they earned would be used to pay their transport and their upkeep. And contract ma labor meant staying away from your family between nine and 18 months of every two years. So you'd be at home for three, four months and be working away from your family for the rest of the period. This meant that families in Namibia were disrupted, that the social fabric was broken down over many decades and many generations. This meant that even today still, you have in, South, in, in Namibia and in South Africa, it's the same system, the after effects of that social disintegration. Um, the struggle for independence was a, a, a long and a, and a bloody one. I mean, you, you had the South West Africa People's Organization, SWAPO. Tell me about them, because they feature very heavily in this film, don't they? Yes. SWAPO was formed in 1960. At a time in the late 50s, quite a number of nationalist movements were emerging out of Southern Africa, inspired very much by what was happening in South Africa. Because migrant laborers didn't only work in Namibia, in the centers of industry, but also in South Africa. And I don't know if you know, but the ANC and the Communist Party of South Africa rose in the 50s. Inspired by that, they created their own nationalist organizations in Namibia. Started off as contract laborers organizations, fighting for an end to contract labor. Very quickly understanding that under international law, their country should have been free, should have been under the control of the United Nations. But South Africa refused those arrangements completely. So they campaigned against the end of contract labor and a return of Namibia to be governed under the mandate system of the United Nations. When South Africa was intractable and met such demands with harsh repression, they sent people to Dar es Salaam. Dar es Salaam in those days was the center of liberation movements from all over South Africa. And Julius Nyerere actually supported the liberation movements of Zimbabwe, Angola, Mozambique, Namibia, and South Africa with means. They provided you know, money for weapons, training, a place for training. And so the Namibians prepared for an armed struggle while still trying to convince South Africa to honor its commitments to the United Nations, and while lobbying, lobbying in New York at the United Nations. There was a long and, and you know, sort of six-year court case where they tried to get South Africa through international law to agree to give the country back to its people. This failed, and this was then the moment when the armed struggle was ripe to start in 1966. Yeah, and on the 26th of August, you had the Battle of Omagulu Gwambashe. Mm. Uh, tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so what happened is they infiltrated people back home, people who'd been trained in the Soviet Union, then coming back to Tar Dar es Salaam, back to Tanzania, and then walked, people walked, took them five months from Tanzania on the east coast of Africa to Namibia. It's like about 8,000 kilometers of walking. Arrived in Namibia, set up a training camp, actually a number of camps, recruited locals, and literally had, as was said, six machine guns and bows and arrows and you know, single bullet rifle loaders from the last century, gathered all the resources they could with the help, of course, of the women and children who hid them. And South Africans intercepted one of the groups that came across. So a number of groups came from Tanzania into Namibia. And from those they intercepted, they turned one of the commanders, as in through torture. 
It's because this man became a very notorious figure, of course, in the history of Namibia. And with his help, they located the camp. Because this is in deep, very vast country. There's no way they could have found these people without inside information. Located the camp and arranged from South Africa, which is also far away, a whole mission of helicopter-based South African soldiers to attack this camp. And the attack on this camp and the resulting skirmishes and the resulting aftermath of skirmishes was the beginning of the armed struggle. The camp's name was Ungulumbashi, and on the 26th of August 1966, it's the beginning of the armed struggle with that attack. Richard, you speak about it um, very passionately. What made you get involved with this? What made you want to direct a film about it? So I'm Namibian. I was born in Namibia. My mother was born in Namibia, my grandmother. My mother was a very socially active doctor who was very influenced by these social movements in the 50s and 60s. So I was raised in a colony of South Africa with a point of view that was unusual, certainly as a person privileged, as a person privileged by being a white colonial, in fact. So I grew up with this awareness. And another very special thing in my life was that I was recruiting to Swapo when I was a young man, when I was 16 years old. Who actually recruited yeah, to Swapo? Yeah, they recruited people who were sort of progressive. Progressives were, you know, in their line of sight. So that made me aware of a lot of things. And my mother had a practice in the township. I, I, was, I was aware of the difference between our life and the life of the majority of the people. And I joined Swapo, and I became an activist in Swapo in this period of the 80s, the late 80s, uh, middle to late 80s, and learned a lot. I was in the trade union movement of Swapo and met these very guerrillas, because these people who started that fight, a lot of them ended up on Robben Island with Nelson Mandela, spent a long time there. And when they were released, it was the same time I finished my studies at, in Cape Town in South Africa, I met with these people. I was actually recruited because they started, they re, um, revived the trade union movement and recruited people like me. And I met them and I heard these stories. And so some years later, I was very inspired to make the film because they were my personal friends. And some of the people in the film <coughs> are, are family friends whose life stories have affected me very deeply. Okay, um, it, it must have been a, a, a very moving experience creating a film out of something that, that is not only your history but, but your, your ancestors' history and the history of your homeland. Um, Richard, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Just to say that it is premiering here in London at the Hare Court United Reformed Church tomorrow on June the 11th. Thank you very much indeed for thank joining me. Thank you very me. much. Really thank you for having me. Thank you, Jeff.